Good afternoon. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I know it's been a long day, so I appreciate you guys hanging out, and, uh, and I hope we can uh, have a good time together. So let's start with this, just to give me context to know where I want to take this talk. How many people in this room have no idea who I am or my spiel? Raise your hand. Well, that fucking hurts. <laughs> Jesus. That's a bad way to start a talk. I kind of figured, actually, so what I'll do is give you a little bit of context of where I come from so the things that I'm gonna talk about might make a lot of sense. Uh, I was born in, uh, in Belarus in the former Soviet Union and my family immigrated to the United States in 1978 when I was three years old. We, uh, we lived in a small studio apartment in Queens, New York with nine family members one eighth of the size of this stage and it was really quite difficult and it was hardcore, right? It was super immigrant, you know, you know, it was my, my sister's baby seat was a car seat found in the garbage. It was kind of raw. Uh, my dad got a job uh, as a stock boy in, in New Jersey and was commuting from Queens to Jersey and eventually worked really hard and became the assistant manager, then manager of that store and eventually we moved to Edison, New Jersey. Edison, New Jersey is where I started my entrepreneurial career. Um, in Edison, I basically put all my friends to work. So when I was six, I had eight lemonade stands in Edison, New Jersey, a franchise. You guys remember Big Wheels, that little like thing, Big Wheels? I used to ride my Big Wheels in Edison, New Jersey and pick up my cash like I was Tony Soprano. <laughs> it was pretty interesting. By the way, on that note, it's amazing what you learn at such a young age if you're entrepreneurial. There was a kid that used to come just for the summers. I didn't know what divorce was or things of that nature back then, so I never understood it. His name was Eric Conrad. He used to come just for the summers. And he was the only friend of mine that actually made signs and tried to sell stuff as well. So he always sold much more lemonade than all my other friends. However, I would always count how many cups I gave everybody and he was actually stealing. He was actually taking a dollar or two each day. But because his revenue was so much higher, I would let him go. So it was pretty fascinating. <laughs> you can learn a lot. When I was 11, I started my baseball card business. So I was doing baseball card shows in the malls of New Jersey uh, and did quite well. I was making two to three thousand dollars a weekend selling baseball cards and that was phenomenal. And I don't know about you guys, but when you have thirty thousand dollars in cash under your bed and you're 13 and you're not selling weed, you're doing a good job. <laughs> so that was good. And everything was rocking. It was gonna be awesome. I was gonna be the biggest baseball card dealer of all time. Everything was great and then I turned 14 and my dad ruined my life. See, I was getting ready for one of the biggest shows in New Jersey and getting my cards together and my dad walks in, he goes, you're coming to the store. I go, dad, I think you're, you're misunderstanding. I have a show today. I'm not quite sure how many of you have a Soviet dad but I lost that argument. <laughs> so I began to cry. I, I basically cried the whole 40 minutes that we commuted because we lived 40 minutes from the store down, the, down Route 78 in Jersey the whole way, crying the whole way. Finally, about two minutes before we get there, I compose myself and I go, Dad, how much are you gonna pay me? And he said, two bucks an hour. And then I really started crying. <laughs> and it was terrible for the next year and a half, every weekend of my life, every single Thanksgiving vacation, every single day of summer vacation, every weekend, I was in my dad's basement of the liquor store bagging ice for 10 hours a day for two bucks an hour. How many people in this room have seen the movie The Goonies? Raise your hand. I was sloth. Remember that guy? Chained to the basement? That was me, I hated it and it was terrible. Then I turned 16 and was allowed upstairs. And my life changed. I was on the floor one day and every person came in asking for Camus Special Select 1990, it was Wine Spectator's Wine of the Year. Everybody. And I was seeing all these customers come in, ask for the wine, and then leave. And I was like, this sucks. Any good punk kid entrepreneur is not gonna let that happen. So the next person that comes in, I'm gonna take a back order. Now we didn't have a back order system, but I wasn't scared because I was going to school on Monday anyway. So, 
So the next person comes in, he goes, you know, I will take some Camus. I'm like, great. I'm like, we're sold out, but I can take a back order. He gives me his name, his address. I go, how much would you like? He said, well, I'll take six cases. And I was like, ooh, an alcoholic. And I was like, are you having a party? And he goes, no, 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 I collect wine. And that was it. Literally, you know how you have these moments, you're probably thinking about your own businesses when like something changed or you thought of it, you can like literally taste it. I can, I can literally, I the, I, can you zoom in? Like the goosebumps are here. Like I can literally feel where I was in my dad's old store in the Chardonnay section when that moment happened because I literally sat there. At this point, I wanted to help my family. I felt like I could bring something to the table. I was pretty ridiculous at 16, thinking like, you know, I knew what I could do. I felt confident. So I remember sitting there and saying, Silver Oak, Camus, Opus One, Chateau Lafitte, Frank Thomas, Ken Griffey Jr., Wayne Gretzky, same shit, I can do this. So literally, (laughs) literally, literally for the rest of my life, up until very recently, I put every ounce of my soul into becoming the greatest wine expert I could and building a huge wine business. I literally sat in science class at junior year, reading the wine spectator. I didn't give a fuck about Saturn, you know? <laughs> I was so all in, and that's what I focused on. Now, I did not grow up techy. The most teched out that I was at 18 years old was that there's nobody in this room that can beat me in NHL 94 for Sega Genesis. I literally didn't even have a computer until I was somewhere around 20 years old. Okay? I was not teched out, I didn't grow up with it, but what I'm obsessed with, what I'm about to talk to you about for the rest of this evening is culture shifts. What people actually do and how it affects it. I'm about to talk to you about social media, but I'm not a social media guy that's like, oh, let's all be kumbaya and rock climb and we're gonna drink tea and everybody's so happy. I don't care. Why I like social media, ready? Headline, ready? Here's why I like social media because it sells shit. (laughs) So, I was hanging out with some nerd friends in college and they're like, check this out, there's this thing, the internet, and we could talk to chicks on this. And so we heard the whole coo coo, that thing, right? And they went on and they're like, look, we're talking to chicks. And literally within the first 20 seconds, I'm like, I can sell stuff on this. And so I understood that this was going to be a platform that mattered And in 1996, 1997, I started plotting a change for my family business. My dad's store was called Shoppers Discount Liquors. I wanted to build the brand. So I launched winelibrary.com in 1997. In 1998, I took over daily operations and I grew that business from a three to a $60 million business in a seven year period. Now, I did that fairly traditionally. I did that through email and banner ads, which is traditional to me by the way. You know, I did it through print and radio and it was great. I was very fortunate because I sat next to my lead developer in our office and he was very teched out. His name was Eric Kastner. If you're on Twitter, at Kastner, K-A-S-T-N-E-R. Hit him up, tell him I'm giving him some love. Anyway, he was showing me a different web it was 04, it was 03, 04, 05, and I was like, what is this stuff? What's this Friendster? What's this MySpace? We were on YouTube extremely early. I'm like, this is changing. See, what I know is this. Marketing for the last 150 years has been push. Every person in this room a decade ago had to do all push marketing to sit in your seat. Whether it was radio or print, email services, banner ads, outdoor media, direct mail, TV push. For the last 150 years, if you wanted to be good in business and marketing such a component of that, you basically had to be a quarterback. You threw the ball. And whoever told their story best in the right platform won. 100 years ago, people stood around a box, the radio. They're like, all right, they liked it. Then they watched TV, but it was always push. Even when the internet itself came, it was push. Banner ads and email services are push. We are living through the first time ever when it's pull. First time. In the first time in our history, customers actually have some semblance of voice and reaction. And the culture shifts we're living through are substantial. Culture shifts. All of you have had a long day. You're about to go eat dinner and drink some wine and do some stuff and whatever. I really need you guys to do me a favor. Please don't bullshit me. Lying is the devil. I need you to raise your hand high when I ask this question. 
I have no interest in your bullshit head nod or your half ass hand, I need your full hand. Can you promise me that? Okay. How many people here, three to five years ago probably, maybe more likely two, whether you said it in public or to yourself, said the following thing. I'm not getting a Facebook account. It's for kids, why would I ever need one? Don't fucking lie, raise your hands. It's a substantial number, thank you very much, put them down. How many of you right now have a Facebook account? Raise your hands. (laughs) Guys, what just happened is the reason that I am gonna buy the New York Jets one day. (laughs) My skill set and my belief is that I got lucky DNA wise to understand what people say they're not going to do but are gonna do. Three years ago at South by Southwest, Dennis Crowley showed me Foursquare. And he's like, check this out. And everybody's talking about it. It's one of the first hundred or so users hanging out, talking about it. Somebody asked me, Gary, are you gonna use Foursquare? I said, no, I don't use anything. I just use it for business. But I think people will use it. He goes, no, that's so stupid. Why would I check in to Foursquare when I can just tweet I'm somewhere? This is not gonna work. I said, Billy. I said, Billy, let me ask you a question. Tonight, when we go to a bar, if you check in, and that bar then gives you a free shot of Jack Daniels, what are you gonna do? And he said, I'm gonna fucking check in. <laughs> and I said, exactly. We like to draw lines in the sand. 90% of this audience just now, which oh by the way, and you might even wanna clap it up for yourselves, you guys are pretty badass. So clap yourselves up, it'll be fun. <laughs> but, you guys are so fucking smart and 90% of you said I'm not gonna do this and now you did it. And that to me is fascinating. Let's go really raw. Who wants to go raw? How many people here 10 years ago said they would never get a cell phone because why would they want anybody to contact them anytime they want? Don't lie, it's gonna hurt. You're not gonna wanna raise your hand, but raise it. Thank you for the honest 40 of you. How many of you do not have a cell phone of those people? Raise your hand. Zero. This is happening every day and marketing is being shifted. Eyeballs are shifting. The way we build our businesses are shifting, yet we continue to do things like it's 2007, six, four, two, one. I'm not mad at the way we market our businesses in traditional ways, I'm really not. But what we have to understand is that it's shifting. Let's talk about outdoor media for one second. How many people here do outdoor media? Just for context, raise your hand. You guys are a smart fucking bunch, all right. That being said, I do. If you live in New Jersey, you might have driven the turnpike and seen a huge billboard of me with a glass of wine. I like outdoor media, makes you seem grand. But when I see companies spending money on outdoor media, I have a problem and here's what it is. Do me a favor, if you remember one thing from this talk, when you're next home, the next time you're home, whether that's today or you fly back and you drive home, the next time you drive, Please look at the five people, at least five people driving next to you. While you're driving, just take a good hard look at five people. I'm gonna tell you right now, three of them are texting. Oprah's right, this shit is dangerous. Three of them. So let me just say it for the record, for all the people at home running businesses. People are not looking at billboards and outdoor media. They're not even looking at the fucking road. How many people here can't wait to run and get their direct mail? Who's up for that? Ooh, ooh, direct mail, who's pumped? I love it when I'm like in these meetings and people are like, we're still doing direct mail, we're a little bit more of a conservative company, Gary. I get it, do you look at direct mail? Fuck no, asshole. How many people here have a TiVo or DVR? Raise your hands. How many people here TiVo or DVR the majority of the shows they watch on television? How many people here, of those people, in 2011, have fast forwarded every single commercial for the year? Raise your hands. Hold them up. You know what, fuck it, stand up. Please do me a favor. Please, I know you're tired, but this would mean so much to me. Please stand up if you fast forwarded every single commercial in 2011. Look around, are you fucking kidding me? And prices are up 18% for commercials? People aren't watching them. Thank you guys so much, that meant a lot. And exercise is good, you know, a little blood flow. How many people watch television with at least one screen in front of them? 
laptop, phone, or iPad? Raise your hand. How many people watch television with two screens, phone and iPad? How many people in this room watch television with three? Phone, iPad, and laptop. Raise your hands. All right, the 60 of you are sick of shit. (laughs) Yet, yet, every piece of creative on television right now, commercial, does not extend the story, does not push the content online. You don't watch a commercial where it tells you to go to Facebook, hit the like button, and see the rest and claim your prize. Reebok Hockey did a good job. I don't know if anybody saw this, look it up. Sidney Crosby was playing his teammate, it was to five, they got to three and it says you wanna see how it finished? Go to Facebook, I click over and in 20 minutes, 20 minutes, they picked up 62,000 fans because people watch and they're sitting right there ready to be activated. The business world, my friends, in 2011 is acting like 2007 and that is where it is our opportunity. Now, what is the thank you economy? Why did I call it thank you? Because thank you means you're welcome and what can I do for you and how can I help you? This will probably be the most retweeted quote of my entire talk. I believe that most people in this room and in business think about content. How many of you in here have heard content is king? Raise your hand. Everybody talks about content. Content's so important. Your product itself, content. Commercials, the way you advertise, your landing pages, the UI, the UX, all that stuff. Content is massively important. If your product's not good, you lose. My wine show that made me famous on the internet, I had to know what I was talking about. The 15 years that I spent learning wine leading up to my first show is what made it work. However, the real secret sauce into why I have 900,000 followers and things of that nature is the word that is the single most important word to every single company in this room. Period, the word. The word for the next decade. Context. We are living in a context war right now. When I think about content, how good your product is, how creative your advertising is, how well you're converting your SEO or pay for click to conversion and landing pages and all that shit. When I think about that, I think about the quote that matters the most right now, which is when Eric Schmidt six months ago said, the amount of content that we are producing as human beings in this world right now from the beginning of mankind, like when we fought dinosaurs and shit, the beginning, until 2003, remember 2003? It was like six seconds ago. From the beginning, every radio, every piece of print, every TV show, every billboard, every song, I'm not just talking the US, Russia, China, global, every piece of content that we as human beings have created from the beginning of mankind until 2003, is now being replicated in volume every 48 hours. No wonder our kids are ADD. How is your content going to break through in a world where there's that much of it? We all know that everything is so fragmented. The water cooler about television now is impossible. There's 73,000 shows and video blogs and everything. We're living a more fragmented world. So do you have the audacity to think that your content is gonna break through? And this is where social comes in. Because we know about global and we sure know that companies like Google and other companies are battling on a local level, right? Google doesn't buy Zagat just for their name if they don't think local is really important over the next five years. However, it is my firm belief that the battle of marketing going forward, which means business, is going to be individual. I believe that we are in the dawn of one-on-one marketing. And in that one-on-one marketing world, the stakes are gonna be very high for all of us because something very ironic is happening. As we all go Jetsons, the action is in being like the Flintstones. It is my firm belief that every single person's grandparents are more prepared to be successful in the next decade than you guys. Because the way business was built in the old days was built on small town rules. And what the internet is doing, and oh by the way, let's talk about the internet. This isn't about social media. I don't give a rat's ass about Facebook or Twitter or Google Plus. These are tools. This is just the maturity of the internet itself. How many people here in this room do not remember the world, don't remember it, pre-internet? Just cannot, do not remember 1993. Raise your hand. Sir, you do not remember 1993? How old are you? 
How much? 36. It's only like 18 years. What did you drink too much in college? You were 18. I didn't mean figuratively. I mean the far majority, 99% of us, remember the world pre-internet. This has all happened very quickly. All the stuff that's relevant and that we talk about didn't even exist a decade ago. When I, when I hear people debate, what's the ROI of social media, right? Like, is it worth it? Like, what's the value? Like, I'm not converting. It just makes me remember why, I'm gonna play over here. It makes me remember why so many businesses fail. The problem is most businesses are not playing the marathon. They're playing the sprint, right? They're not worried about lifetime value and retention. They're worried about short-term goals. Social is not going to excite anybody in this room for what it's going to do to your bottom line in a six month or 12 month period. It just can't happen. See, social media marketing is like going Beyonce on your customers. You've gotta put a fucking ring on it. (laughs) Meanwhile, 99% of the people in here, and I looked at some Twitter and Facebook accounts of some of the peeps in this room, 90% of you, more, but I'm trying to be nice, are treating social media like a one night stand. Most companies are failing in social because everybody in social is acting like a 19 year old dude. They're trying to close on the first transaction. It's going right? (laughs) The stakes are so ridiculously high. The first talk I ever gave was about e-commerce in 1995, 1996. Guy came out with a PowerPoint and gave so much data on why people would never put their credit card into a computer, you would have left so convinced you just couldn't even conceive of launching a dot-com. There's no way, it was a conservative audience, and then he was pretty gangster, I actually respected his bravado. He goes, and this kid's gonna come out next and tell you that you're gonna buy wine on the internet. And everybody's like, ha, 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 ha. So I come out. And my opening line is, first of all, I respect your gangster style, so thank you, but number two, the only thing I wish is that this was being recorded because in 10 to 15 years, Mr. PowerPoint, you're gonna be fucking wrong. So that was my opening line. By the way, he was, and we know that. What I am shocked at right now is that people that are building real businesses who've seen this happen before, Every debate of the ROI of social right now is the same conversation we had about e-commerce. People don't want to bet on the culture shift because it's not happening in the next 20 minutes. It's hard. People don't want to do that. However, I promise you, the companies in this room that don't bet on it, don't go all in, because the big problem is most people in this room are half pregnant. You're half in. You kind of want to be in but then you don't see the quick results and you hedge. You don't understand what's really happening because for the first time ever, it's not push. For the first time ever, marketing isn't what I'm doing right now. Giving a presentation and hoping it converts. For the first time ever, it's a cocktail party. Everybody's in play. Totally different skill set of giving a good presentation up here and then working the room like a cocktail party. Totally different. I dominate both, but some don't. Let me give you an example of the thank you economy. We've created a thank you department at winelibrary.com, my business. I was talking to Kristen, the head of the thank you department, which, oh, by the way, is not customer service. The thank you department is playing offense. Customer service on social media is playing defense. So we're playing a little offense. Customer comes in, I call Kristen, I go, listen, the book's about to come out, I need some examples for this crowd, something that's relevant, something that's real and tangible, not me just going up there and saying, here, do it. Customer places an order from Chicago, and we find who he is on Twitter. And then we follow him in the month of January, and here's what we saw. Jay Cutler, I love you. Super Bowl runs through Chicago, bitch. Packers, you suck. Aaron Rodgers, you're dead. Yeah, we won today. Next stop, Super Bowl. Today's the big game. Oh shit, Jay Cutler's hurt. We're in trouble. Crap, we lost. But I still love you, Jay Cutler, okay? (laughs) We took that data. So the data I have in a normal 1995 world was 
he likes Barolo and Brunello. The information I have today is what hits him in the emotional center. What he's willing to put out to the world and what paints a picture about who he is. So I called Kristen after she sent me this data and I said, Kristen, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to eBay and I want you to buy a Jay Cutler signed jersey and send it to him with a note saying, thank you for your first order with winelibrary.com. And that was it. And that was kind of the talk I was giving for the first part of the book to tell people about some of the things we're looking at. That consumers are putting out more data than ever and we can really leverage that data to give one-on-one marketing to win their wallet. Because it's all about lifetime value, not about the spend you get right now. But over the last couple of weeks, the story's changed on stage because something good happened. He finally emailed back. And he said, hey, you know, first of all, I, I, Kristen, thank you so much. You know, I'm a hedge fund guy in Chicago. I'm very, very busy. I got the jersey, I love it. It's framed in my office. I didn't have time to write you back. Amazing. How did you know? But I just want you to know that I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars with Sam's in Chicago, which is a great store if you're in Chicago, you should shop there, a great store. I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars there, but they've never done anything for me. When I walk in the store, they don't even know who I am. This gesture means a lot to me and count yourself as somebody that I want to do business with the rest of my life. Now, that's fine and dandy. That's big play, one-on-one. How do you scale it, right? Is something that's gonna be brought up in the seats right now. We do other things. We started doing something else. We call every single customer that places an order now and thank them. And that's it. Jersey is one of the few states where you can actually record the conversation of a phone call. For pretty interesting reasons, I'm sure. (laughs) So I've been able to actually listen to some of these things. Here's how it goes. Hello Susan, this is Lily from winelibrary.com. I just wanted to call you and thank you for your order. Hope you have a great day. Uh Uh-huh. That's it, have a great day, bye. About 7% of the people we're calling right now are calling back apologizing for being rude because they thought there was going to be another shoe dropping on the phone call. That's where we got. People got real cynical. We're always in sales mode. See, it's super funny. People are marketing right now the way people plan weddings. It's really funny to me watching wedding planning. I bust on a lot of my wife's friends about this. I truly believe in my heart that most people put way more time and effort and oomph into planning their wedding than putting energy into their actual marriage. And I truly believe that that is the analogy of how people are treating their business and marketing tactics. I firmly, firmly believe that. And I really think about that every day. I believe that we're living through such an unbelievable time. Let me paint you a picture of 2017. How many of you are real nerdy? Who knows what NFC technology is? Raise your hand. Small amount. NFC, it's a chip and a phone. Near field communication. Here's what's gonna happen in 2016, 17. Ready? I'm gonna walk into Walgreens and I'm gonna take out my phone because that's what we all do all the fucking time. I'm just gonna be looking at it while I'm looking for some chips and shit. And then I'm gonna see on my news feed, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Tumblr or something else, I really don't care. Please don't care about that part. And I'm gonna see that Johnny says that chocolate covered pretzels from Wise are delicious. Because oh by the way, I don't know if you know this, we are social creatures. We are sharing things on these platforms that none of us would have ever picked up the phone and called a friend about. Nobody 10 years ago was gonna call, pick up the phone and call their friend and say, pink berry watermelon is yummers. <laughs> Nobody does that. But now all of you do that all the time. We're extroverts even if we're introverted. The reason the fashion industry is a good trillion dollar industry is because inherently, as animals, we want to express ourselves. It's how we roll, period. That is the same dynamic in play in social. We want to do it. I know when you first saw Twitter, you thought it was the dumbest shit ever. You said to yourself, who gives a fuck if I'm eating a pizza, right? I know what you thought. The problem is you didn't realize that this social media game, it isn't about talking. All of you need to wire your mouth shut and start using your big fucking ears because that is the game in play. So what's gonna happen is Johnny's gonna say chocolate covered pretzels are yummers and I'm gonna be like, okay. And because Wise Potato Chip Company is in play and has an incentive anytime their brand is mentioned, I'll see a little icon, I'll click, and because they're gonna know that I'm in Walgreens, it's gonna say buy Wise Potato Chips chocolate covered pretzels right now and get 50 cents off. And you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna buy those fucking pretzels. And you know what that is? 
ROI. And when you start looking at status updates or pushes in a social environment that is not done by your companies, but is done by word of mouth of the ecosystem, and you could see that this one comment led to $74,000 in transactions, whether you have a store or a website or whatever it is, that's when people are gonna start paying attention. Because what every person knows in this room, how many people here have gotten some form of business because of word of mouth? Raise your hand. All of you, period. Word of mouth is the currency. And now we have infrastructure for word of mouth to be on steroids. Word of mouth is hanging out with Barry fucking Bonds. It carries dramatically further than it ever did before. When I used to do my surprise and delights back in the day, it didn't carry the weight it does today. When I had a lady call me from Bergen County complaining because FedEx threw her package in the bushes and she couldn't get it because she was 647 years old and on three days before Christmas, I took a case of Behringer Whites in and threw it in my car and drove it up there and gave it to her during peak hours, I wasn't gonna get pressed for that. 60 Minutes wasn't following me, but today our actions and our engagements are being spread. They just are and every day our consumer base no matter who you're reaching, is getting more and more into that ecosystem. And sure, you see things like what Facebook did this week to push those envelopes, and they might go too far and it comes back and it flows, but the cat's out of the bag. Because the fundamental fact of the matter is, is even though it's going through your mind right now, nobody gives a fuck about privacy. I know. Some of you think I'm a dickhead right now, but I'm telling you I'm not. I'll tell you why. Because the cause of privacy, the pain point of privacy is money, right? And health. See, the news and traditional media have told us that we're bad. The most underrated brand in the world, my friends, is us. Brand human being is the number one underrated thing. The problem is we always watch the news and they tell us how bad we are. We killed this kid, we raped that kid, we stole this car. You only hear the bad, but if you look at the data, In the world we're living in now, where people know where you are all the time, it is stunning how little bad stuff is going on. It's shocking by data, but we don't wanna talk about that. And so we focus on things that nobody cares about. Remember Foursquare and everybody said, well now people are gonna rob your home when you check into places? Well when you left a status update on Facebook saying you were on vacation, they could have done it too. Nothing changed, it's just the same argument being recycled all the time. We are living in one business, all of us, one. We are in the eyeballs and ears business. No matter what you do and how you roll, B2B or B2C, you are in the eyeballs and ears business. We are trying to convert. We are living through a massive culture shift of where those eyes and ears go. We just do. And what I'm fascinated by is what happens when you start creating context. How many people here knew of me before I gave this talk? And looking at the crowd, a lot of you I know as well. I know Rizzo right over here, right? I have different context towards him. I feel differently. When I was out here talking, I was like, shit, his beard's getting heavier. Like, you know, I have context. I have an emotional relationship. A bunch of you now are gonna come to the table at the book signing, and we're gonna create more context. I am fascinated by what you're willing to do for your mother that you're not willing to do for your brother. And that for your brother, what you're not willing to do for your best friend. And for your best friend, what you're not willing to do for an acquaintance. And for your acquaintance, what you're not willing to do for a coworker. And for your coworker, what you're not willing to do to a kind of stranger. And for that kind of stranger, what you're willing to do that you're not willing to do to a perfect stranger. Like Balki Bartokamas, remember him? Anyway, that is the game. I believe that companies have the opportunity to take themselves from a non-human element to a human element. I believe, and this is about to get real weird, so stick with me for a half a sec, I believe that we're living through the beginning of the humanization of logos. That we are going to have relationship with logos. I equate it very similar to what's happened with the pet dog. If you look at the data of the pet dog in the 1950s, Spot spent most of his time outside. Now Spot's inside. But I think as many of you know, Spot's pretty aggressive. He actually doesn't only live inside, he lives in your bedroom. And I don't know about this, but you might know, Spot actually wears better clothes than you do. (laughs) And he wears better clothes and he eats better than you do because he eats gourmet every single night. You don't let your kids into your bedroom and Spot sleeps on your bed. That is what has happened with the data. We have humanized Spot. 
Once we're done humanizing our circle, we humanize our pet. And if you start looking, Lipton Brisk Ice Tea is one of our clients. During the NBA draft this year, we had one of the highest engagements around the NBA draft with Lipton Brisk because people were asking, hey, at Lipton, at Brisk, what do you think about that pick in the second round? Truly treating our logo like their boy. Truly humanizing, why? Because when we engage on Facebook and Twitter and these platforms, we're not just using it as a press release. So many of the companies in here, when I was doing my little search, are using their Facebook pages as another newsletter. How many people here have done email marketing in their career? Raise your hand. A lot. How many of you have done it for more than seven years? Raise your hand. Just curious. Okay, so the 30 of you will know exactly what I'm talking about. Open rates on email are nowhere close to what they used to be 10 years ago. Do you guys remember how much this country loved email 15 years ago? They made a movie called You've Got Mail. We loved it. You were so pumped. It was like Christmas back in the day when you heard, you've got mail. You're like, fuck yes. You were pumped. (laughs) How many people here love email now? If you look at email open rates over the last, since mid-2009, last two years, they're down 20% globally, down. The whole Groupon and living social phenomenon, that deal of the day, Guild Group, Kevin was speaking here today about operations, that whole crew, those guys mastered the email game and conversion. But remember how you felt two years ago when you first found out about one of these sites? You couldn't wait, couldn't wait to buy $40 worth of sushi for 20 bucks. You were so pumped to get a bikini wax for half price. You were pumped. (laughs) Now, the email open rates are so down, you don't give a shit if Groupon's offering you a million dollar home for 300 bucks, you're deleting that shit as spam. (laughs) Because here's the big point. Everything I believe about the new social web, everything I wrote about in my book will be ruined in five years. Seriously, everything I truly believe in from a marketing standpoint, will be ruined five years from today. Because there's a funny little secret. Marketers ruin everything. (laughs) Everything I believe that's coming from the right place is going to become a tactic. And people are gonna be doing these things over and over. It's gonna be the free shipping rule. Free shipping. Winelibrary.com, 1998. First time we ever did it. We sold so much wine that weekend, I was in the store till five in the morning and then coming back in at seven for three days in a row just to catch up with all the orders. We sold so much that wine that weekend, it's like people thought their cure was inside of all those wine bottles. <laughs> One guy places an order and in his notes says, thank you so much for doing this, perfect for me. My daughter, I'm gonna buy this for my daughter's wedding. Me living in the thank you economy back then and not knowing what it was, decide to call him and thank him. Jim, thank you so much. Where is the wedding? I'd like to send a nice bottle of champagne to celebrate the wedding. He goes, oh no, 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 Gary. My daughter's 12 years old. (laughs) I said, what? He goes, my daughter's 12 years old. He goes, but this is such a sick deal, I'm gonna put this wine in the basement and we'll save it for her wedding. (laughs) Now, every single person in this room 13 years later doesn't buy anything online unless It has free shipping. We're all primed out and everything else. This is going to become a tactic. We have a 36 to 60 month window to create context. We know what happens when we touch our consumers. Our Twitter customers at winelibrary.com are outperforming our non-Twitter engaged customers by 60% because we created context. We answered a wine question, they feel more emotional about us and they're buying from us. That is how it used to be in the small town rules. In the 1930s and 40s, when you went to your butcher's store, the second you opened that door, that man was cutting your roast beef because he knew things about you. You lived in a small town room. We literally left our laundry outside. We left our front doors open. We knew a lot about each other. We are now replicating that. How many people here have connected with somebody on Facebook that they had not talked to prior to that in over 10 years? Raise your hands. Almost everybody. How about 20 years? Crazy, half, 30? 40? You don't even look 40, looking good my man. Some good shit, what did you find your friend from like second, when you were three? Look good. You look good too for 36 by the way, but your memory's shit. (laughs) 
Your social graph is bigger than it ever was. Dunbar's number is fucked. It's gonna be bigger. And what's going to happen is, those people in your lives who are much more emotionally pointed to your heart than a banner ad, or an email newsletter, or a piece of mail, or a commercial that you never watch, by the way, or outdoor media, is going to convert better. Word of mouth is going to scale, your graph is bigger, people are going to recommend products, we're not gonna hide anywhere, no more worrying about Yelp, because the next Yelp is the one that doesn't let you be anybody but your true self. And when we're gonna go to real identity, when we go then, then your social equity is gonna drive your business. Then doing the right thing is gonna really matter. We live in a crazy world. I'm a micro, 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 micro celebrity on the internet. And I went to my brother-in-law's bachelor party in Vegas last October. This is my wife's brother. If there was an ever a time you can go to the strip club in Vegas, this was it. And when the boys were like, let's go, I'm like, fuck it. I don't want a twit pic of me in there. We are living in a world where there's no hiding. Most of my corporate clients, two, three years ago, I started a company called VaynerMedia doing community management and strategy for big brands. PepsiCo and Campbell's and Green Mountain Coffee and GE, big boy brands, not entrepreneurial stuff. Big boy brands, big girl brands. And they always tell me, Gary, but what about when we have a problem? You know, what happens when we, you know, something happens and they all come in? The question always is, well, were you wrong? They're like, yeah, but, I'm like, no, no, no. If you're feeding children shit that's gonna make them sick, you deserve to lose. That's what's going to happen. The way we all do business is gonna change so fundamentally by these culture shifts. I'm going to watch a New York Jets game in 10 years on my new Apple television, not that dorky thing that everybody has to hook up, like a television, and when Mark Sanchez throws a touchdown pass, my remote control, which is gonna look something like an iPad, is gonna say, do you wanna buy a Mark Sanchez jersey? And at the height of my excitement, I'm gonna say yes. And the height of your excitement when you're watching something that looks like Gossip Girl and Sex in the City and you're gonna be like, oh my God, Pamela's shoes are so fucking phenomenal, you're gonna buy two pairs. The culture we live in is going to shift constantly. Guys, I don't know if you're paying attention, SEO is dying in front of our eyes. SEO is changing, the way we search. I mean, Google's in such an interesting place. I mean, I don't know about you guys, how many people here have recently had something come up and whereas in three or four years ago you would have went to Google and searched, you went to Twitter and searched? Raise your hand, just curious. Small amount, which is interesting to me, based on this demo. I beg you to try to remember to do this. The next time something catches your eye, to go to Twitter search instead of Google search and see what your experience is like. See how it's different. Because real-time search brings enormous context and value. And how that ecosystem works is fascinating to me. Including, excuse me, including buying ads in real time as a current event is happening. What happens during a hurricane when you've got extra you know, tape or whatever the hell you need for a hurricane, you know, or during a huge snowstorm when a small company puts out that they have shovels, when everybody's searching to check the news on it and you're the first ad there, this is being replicated. Everything that helped me build my business with Google is now being replicated in social search. And more importantly, the algorithm of the news feed today that goes in my face from social is so much more important to me than the SEO of Google. And I know, because I look at this stuff, when you go to Google, you have intent to buy more often than social. But what happens when that becomes your ecosystem? See, what's fascinating to me is this. This room is very smart. Very smart. I'm super pumped to be here, by the way. I, I, I love this whole conference and I love the thought of 500 and 5,000. And I get blown away when I was doing the homework on the way here, if this is creme de la creme, because you're entrepreneurial. This is, you know, to get in here, you've got to be growing. So if you have a big base, and looking at how young this space is, I'm, I'm shocked from 06 to be here, I thought that everybody would know, but I'm starting to learn it takes time and that's where the opportunity is. It blows my mind that I can sit in a conference like this and say, it's not too late. It blows my mind that every, how many people here for their business, whether it's you or somebody in your business, go to twitter.com slash search and search your brand or things around your brand every single day, raise your hand. That's like 4% of this room, that means there's a huge opportunity. Creme de la creme, 4%, which means nobody else is really doing it. Right now, on your Blackberry or phone, you can search your brand, your handle, on twitter.com search and see what people are saying about you. 
It is 2012 almost, my friends. I have no idea how you can justify leaving any engagement behind on the social web in a 2011, 2012 world. None of you would be going out to pizza in your local town, sitting next to a couple, hearing, talking about your business, and you would have stayed shut. None of you. You would have all got caught up and said thank you, or how can I help you, or couldn't help but over here, but that's my company, thank you so much. None of you, yet, all of you are leaving that in a scalable way on a daily basis. The reason I was able to grow my businesses was not because I was putting out good content, it's because every day after producing 30 minutes of wine television, I spent 15 hours a day answering every single person's email and every single person's Twitter at reply and created context and relationship with that end user. These are the fucking people that buy our shit. And you're worried about all your internal shit, and you should, because I'm obsessed with operations, but I know people have been talking about that all day. These are the people that put the cash in your wallet, and we are leaving these engagements on the table. It blows my mind. Do you know how fun it is to answer what white wine goes with fish 68,000 times a year? It sucks shit, but I did it. By the way, it's not Pinot Grigio, get over that shit. Content is gonna continue to grow. The ability to build a business in an online world is so low. If you think about the entrepreneurs before us, they were so unlucky. It costs so much more capital and time to build a business. The piping of the internet and the ecosystem we live in has allowed companies to come out of nowhere very, very quickly. What that means for all of you is that it's a race. It's a branding race, but most of all, it's a context race. To me, I start getting fascinated when companies start worrying about acquiring and start worrying about holding on to. When companies start worrying about hunting and start worrying about farming. You know, ideally, right? They won, right? One of our first clients. When we first started with them, a lot of push. Look at our shoes, look at this. We built a community talking about fashion and then conversion went up. Kevin Ryan, Gilt Group. Those guys in Groupon and Living Social, local company here, Living Social, they understood how to map acquiring customers. It's a science, they figured it out. They have a cost, they retargeted, they put little cookies on you, you saw their ad everywhere, and they figured out the cost. The problem is when you look at a lot of businesses like those and others, their real challenge is retention. Retention is the game. Lifetime value is the game. And there's only one way to do it, humans. It's crazy. I'm building companies that have a crap load of humans. It's crazy, the human being is the value. Like I said, as we go new wave, the human being is where it's at. You can't outsource it. You can't automate real feelings. I'll leave you with this and I wanna do a couple questions. I was in the room with a very conservative CMO and she was really drilling me. She was like, but what's the ROI of social media? And I'm giving her my best stuff. For example, if you want some best stuff, go look at what your engagement rate is on your Facebook page. You have a certain amount of fans, and then you have a post, go look at the number. Is it .01, is it .02? It doesn't matter how many fans and Twitter followers you have, it's how many of them are gonna buy something and give a fuck. So she's drilling me and I'm giving her some really good metrics, at least for a 2011 world, and she's pushing, and I know why. She works in a conservative company, and the more conservative she comes across, the more likely she'll be the CEO. I get it, I'm fine. But she's pushing and pushing, and finally I look at her and I go, She's like, but Gary, what's the ROI? And I'm like, da da da. She's like, but what's the real ROI of social media? And I'm doing my normal thing, like, can you give me the ROI of television and print? Because I love that you spend a shitload of money on Vogue and you're buying the subscription, but can you guarantee me that somebody's looking at the ad on page 139? Because you can't. And I'm giving her everything I've got, and she's still punching me directly in the throat. So I had to pull it out. She goes, what's the ROI of social media? What's the ROI of social media? So I look at her and go, what's the ROI of your mother? She said, excuse me. I said, "Uh uh-oh. I said, I have no interest in making a mother joke and I'm not making fun of you. But let me explain one thing to you. The ROI of my mother is everything. The reason I'm going to buy a multi-billion dollar sports franchise is because of my mother. My mother, the way she parented me, which oh by the way is perfectly, is the reason I have the ability, the confidence, and the absolute wherewithal to execute the businesses that I'm building. However, my friends, 
at Inc. 500. I cannot come to you with slides and put them on those screens and say, over here, click, in sixth grade when I got a mullet, you know, and my mom said I was gorgeous and beautiful and I could do anything, well that was building self-esteem and so what I did with that on the next slide is, you'll see here, I sold a couple more cases of wine in 1994 because of that self-esteem which led to this and now, I can't show you. I can't show you in data the ROI of my mother but I promise you, it's all of it. The whole kit and caboodle. Social's gonna prove it because social has way better metrics than traditional. Some asshole stood at the top of a building with a clicker and counted how many cars drove by a billboard and that's the metrics we're using. Do you know that people do little fucking Scantron-like cards to tell Nielsen's what shows they watched? Are you fucking kidding me? (laughs) However, thank you for that one clap, that meant a lot. However, (laughs) however we keep poking holes in social. You know why? I know the size of your company is similar to what I'm used to. You're busy, you're doing a lot of stuff and you need to grow, I get it but please, audit yourself. Figure out what you're doing. When people always talk to me and say, but how do you scale this? I say you take all the money you're spending on dumb shit and you put it into humans. Thank you. I mean, a standing up. You're my only, oh shit. Thank you, Ben. So I think, Thank you so much. I think I have two minutes for Q&A. Oh shit, this is heavy. Okay, who's got a question? This gentleman over here, this gentleman over here. <laughs> 36, but can't remember shit. Hey. How, what's your name, my man? I'm John. And, um, nice to meet you, man. Hey, nice to meet you too, you're Real awesome. Pleasure. Thank you. Hey, so one of my goals was to figure out the social media deal, so I appreciate what your words are. I own a newspaper company. Okay. So my biggest concern is, uh, how, you know, how do you monetize the content? Content's good, but how do you, you know, what is a media company, you know, how do we look at that? Guys, listen, media is a commodity now. It's, it's, it's just truth. Listen, some dude bought 1,200 horses the day before Henry Ford created the car. He fucking lost. Right? I mean, that's just the way it is. Business doesn't give a shit. Innovation doesn't give a shit about you, me, or anybody. What you need to do is take that brand equity and while you've got some eyeballs there and start understanding how to convert them into something else. I mean, that's just the truth. Holding on to what emotionally feels good is a really good way to go out of business. You know, I mean, that's just the way, that's the truth of the matter. It's gonna be very hard for you or any of the smart people here to sit around in a brainstorming session and say, okay, who's reading newspapers in 12 years? And you're a young dude. So I would take that brand equity and I would start siphoning as qu- like, like, like the way you siphon gas as fast as you fucking can to get them to go to some other platform. Monetizing content is extremely difficult. However, look at a site called Refinery29. It's a fashion site, it's a competitor of Idealies. They've done a really good job with content and commerce. You've gotta really rethink this, man. I mean, there's just, there's nothing cute about it. I mean, you know, we know that the music industry got disrupted, right? Clearly your industry did, but I promise you the thing that this room is underestimating is communication has been disrupted. How many of you have children, nieces or nephews that are between 12 and 18 years old? Raise your hand. So you guys know, I love this debate three years ago when I heard like parents, my friends that were in their 30s and 40s saying, I'm never gonna text with my child, they want me to text, only phone call. How many of you remember having that thought? Yeah, how many of you now are texting only with your children? Exactly. So. The fact of the matter is, is that communication's being disrupted. Content's a commodity. It's a commodity. Anybody can do it. Everybody's gonna cry about the journalistic quality. Great, if you're so fucking good, win. If it's so good, if it's such good journalism, then win. And so, it's tough, man. Every 48 hours. I mean, that's just the truth of the matter. And the way distribution is done, it's just been disrupted. And so what I would tell you to do is take the last equity or all the equity that you have there, really think about what you're doing with it. Yeah, question? Yeah, right here. What's your name, my man? I'm Jacob Dalek. Hey. Uh, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Good. Um, Were you about to introduce the rest of your team? This is my partner, Aaron, also brother. How are you, man? Uh, we own a company called Cheap Ink, and we sell ink cartridges and toner. Okay. And we are launching our uh, e-commerce website, and we know that it's uh, a field that is pretty saturated and we are very focused on doing a lot of things to differentiate ourselves in it. We've been in it for nine years so we're familiar with it. Yeah, you know it. My question is, um, 
we are, we're trying to do things on Facebook and use social media to market ourselves, but ink cartridges and toner are not the sexiest of products. I don't know, I'm, I'm having sure a boner about it. It's pretty exciting. <laughs> ink is sh the shit, man. Hey, me too. I mean, Honestly, I love like, you know, change, you know, turn that frown upside down. I mean, like, ink could be no, the no, shit. No, no, it's not a frown. I mean, I have some ideas about it, but. No, but I get it. I'm making a joke. Uh, what, Fair my, enough. My Go question, ahead. My, my question to you, <laughs> My question to you is how do I make it interesting or do I have to on social media? Literally, if we ran into a coffee shop and I was giving you 20 minutes of advice, I've got the piece right now. Map everybody who you know is the buyer of in an office, right? Because I, 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 let, let me ask a better question. How much of your business is B2B? Like how much is it the buyer, the office manager? It's not the individual, right? It's, that must be a lot. It is. It is a mixture of, of individuals and also small, what, medium-sized businesses. What's the mixture? What's the mixture? Yeah. It's more B2B. How much? 60, 40 probably. Okay, so you know, one thing I would definitely use is a combination of LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook. Map your entire consumer base, right? So everybody, how many people do you have in your customer database right now? I mean, right now, uh, we're, re we're relaunching a product right now, our product right now. You've so got probably, customers, right? Yeah, we have about 50 to 100. Oh, so it's really, it's like a small group of people. Yes. I mean, we. So, so first and foremost, how much thank you economy stuff are you doing with those 50 to 100 people? Because honestly, I'd be at their house sh shoveling their fucking driveways during snowstorms. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So first things first, I papa, that was just a little fun, but first things first, I highly recommend that you go really deep emotionally with that small of a customer base. I'm dying to know when the last time you talked to them casually in a non-business way has happened with those 50 to 100. Hey brother, stand up. How many times? Uh. We talk with our customers on instant message, all that, pretty regularly, actually. I would highly um, recommend trying to shift into some sort of emotional center, right? So, like, a good example is one of the people we worked with at Quaker, client, he mentioned something really subtly that he played high school football for one day because he went from soccer to football and he was trying to blitz as a linebacker and this offensive tackle threw him into, like, you know, the next state and he mentioned a player, and it was an actually a player that played for the NFL. When we got back, I ordered that player's jersey and sent it to him. There's ways to have real relationships with people. When you have as small of a customer base as you guys have, those 50 to 100 people literally need to become your best friends. Yeah, and we're trying to grow that significantly. Of That's course, part of but guess what? When you, have, when you have 600 of them, those fuckers need to be your best friends too. Yep. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So I, I think that's one thing to understand. And by the way, you should map who they are socially. Back to my Jay Cutler story, you should email them and ask them who they are on Facebook and Twitter and friends with them and watch what they're talking about. You, you'd be stunned. In the Thank You Economy, in my book, there's one tweet where somebody complains about a phone service, somebody jumps in, helps them, and lands a $250,000 gig based on one tweet. You know what I call that? ROI. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was thinking that we could even add it in when we're asking them to sign up and things like that so that they know that we're actively engaging with them beyond. It's good, but push that human element. I mean, you got, you're sitting in such a great spot as a business to be that small of a customer base, you can really push the envelope. You know, going through a survey is not human. You calling yeah. and being like, how's your day going? Like, what other needs can we have? Like, notice that you have your power went out on Twitter. I'm coming <laughs> over with my generator. That's how you keep somebody for the rest of their lives. It's true. And that data is being put out now that it wasn't 10 years ago. And you know why people aren't gonna do it? Because it's fucking hard and people are dicks. <laughs> but if you're a good guy, you can win. Well, and that's what we're trying to do. We want to be as close to our customers as possible to make them happy so and then easy do to it. use. Just one more thing. Yeah. We're from Chicago, easy on Jake Cullen. <laughs> <Got it. laughs> All right, one more and then I think I gotta do the book signing. Yes, sir. All right. What's your name? My name is Jeff. Uh, thanks Jeff. for thanks for taking my question. Sure, you, uh, man. It was good stuff. Thanks, liked, liked what you had to say. Thanks. Um, I'm talking about when you're 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 kind of talking about what would you do for your mother and then for your brother and yeah. then for a complete stranger. Yeah. Um, I started a company called Red Monkey Foods. We do gourmet seasonings and spices. So since I am a complete stranger, would you mind uh, tweeting about it to your 900,000 friends? Good hustle. I'm obsessed with hustle, right? But see, what I find interesting is, even though I just gave a really passionate talk, you went for the 19-year-old dude move, right? <laughs> you tried to close on our first transaction. And so, that gives you a big fucking no. But, <laughs> but, I do love your swag and your hustle, and that's why you're sitting in the room. 
You go and hedge that. You know, we're all the, guys, I told you my first business was lemonade stands because I really didn't want to tell you what it really was. My first business was really four and a half. I used to go to people's yards, rip their flowers out of their yard, ring their doorbell, and sell it back to them. <laughs> so I'm like you, I'm gangster, right? I'm sales. I'm not up here, Mother Teresa, love your 50 people. I only, remember, you forgot, because it was an hour ago. I only do this because it's how business is going to be done. I'm only interested in this stuff because it converts and it's going to be the only thing against the amount of noise that's going to be going on in the world. So, what would have been more interesting is when I talked about you know, the stake I was having for you to like send and say, hey, I saw you Inc. 500 and I'm sending you a little you know, spice that would go really great with that and then I would say, ah, good thank you economy tactic, let me retweet it. But now you fucking blew it, but there's a lot of other, <laughs> but there's a lot of other pretty girls out there so the next time you go into the social media bar, don't be a douchebag, roll deep. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>